Good evening. Good evening and welcome to our Director Circle Art Spotlight. I'm Swan Soller and it is my privilege to serve as Chairman of the Telfair Board of Trustees. And on behalf of the Board and the staff, we are delighted to welcome you tonight. We are very grateful to you, our Director Circle. You are our most devoted and generous patrons. And we hope that if you brought guests with you tonight, they will consider joining this group and take advantage of lectures such as this one in the future. It is my pleasure tonight to introduce our speaker, Michelle Andalun. Michelle, you know what? I goofed that up. And how many of y'all have ever seen the Disney movie Andalasia with Andalasia in it? I told her, I'm so sorry. It's <laughs> I just went blank. Andonian. Andonian, that's correct. I know y'all are going to be talking about me tonight and tomorrow. <laughs> I have two more weeks in this job, and so you can do it. <laughs> it's been a long two years, and there you go. Michelle kept. <laughs> Thank you, you're very generous. Um, Michelle captures powerful stories through her award-winning photographs and videos with a resume full of intense creative projects that include books, videos, and exhibitions. Her work is marked by originality and deep understanding of the human condition. She was a photo editor of the Washington Post magazine and a senior editor at Detroit Monthly. She started her career 30 years ago as a staff photographer at the Detroit News, where she was nominated for Pulitzer. Michelle studied at the College for the Creative Studies in Detroit, as well as the International Study for Photography. Her photographs are in the permanent collection of the Detroit Institute of the Arts, the Henry Ford Museum, the Grand Rapids Art Museum, as well as public and private collections worldwide. And probably more relevant to us, she was Raina Edgar's first photography instructor. So please join me in welcoming to the Tell Fair, Michelle. Thank you. <laughs> All right, I'm going to set my timer so I don't get out of control here. <laughs> Thank you. Everybody sound OK um, for coming and being here. And thank you, Raina, for bringing me in. You're one of my proudest students that ever came through my classes at CCS. And uh, um, it's just a pleasure to be here in Savannah. What a great city you have here. I've really, really enjoyed my time. So uh, to no ado, we're going to run through 40 years of my life. Um, but I'm going to try and take it like a minute a year, not even that, like 30 <laughs> seconds each year. So we should be done you know, in a reasonable amount of time. Um, but I'm going to start off <laughs> with a photograph. Will this just come up now? How do we get the images on? Are you up there? OK, awesome. Yeah, don't ask me to figure it out. Um, this image is kind of like a talisman for me. Photography has always been about documenting what is important, who is in my life, in our life, photographing our time. And a big influence on me were my, was my Armenian grandmother, um, who is on, the, on this side, right here. She was a, they, all three of them, her aunt and her aunt's, uh, her aunt's husband, were survivors of the Armenian Genocide and came over to the United States in 1918. Genocide started in 1915 and settled in Detroit. And that's where I grew up. And I grew up with all of these crazy Armenian aunts and uncles who weren't my aunts and uncles. Yeah, you know, I mean, you just can't replace that kind of life. And uh, so I always kind of like to bring them into the room, so welcome. Um, when I first started 
I decided to be a photographer. Um, outside of it was the only class that I really did well in in high school. Um, when I graduated, I just knew that I was going to be a photographer. I wanted to be a photographer, and I just focused clearly on that. Um, I started going to the school at the College for Creative Studies, so we're going back to the very beginning where I felt comfortable being able to photograph people. These, these are people in my neighborhood. Um, this is my father's godmother, another Armenian survivor, Herbie and Fritzy, who used to fix our bikes, Mayor George, the mayor of Fourth Street. I've always been kind of drawn to the characters, and that gave me the experience and the opportunity to kind of get comfortable, right, with people and know what it took to make them comfortable. Um, growing up in Detroit, and you'll see my work goes from Detroit subject matter to Armenian subject matter. I've really never strayed that far from that in my personal work. Um, you know, my, the work that I have done throughout my career has taken me around the world, so we will do a quick round on that. But J.L. Hudson's was the department store in downtown Detroit that we grew up in. And it was the world's tallest building, Guinness World Book of Records, 787 dressing rooms. I mean, as a kid, I got my first haircut. And then as an adult, I knew it was going to close. And so one day, I just said, today I have to go to Hudson's, because I wanted to photograph it before it closed. And I got up early in the morning. I spent the whole day there. I got home that night, and they had announced that it was the last day the store was open. So it's a good thing I followed my instinct, which I know sometimes I don't do. And I had processed those pictures that evening and decided that night I wanted to work at a newspaper. I wanted to go into journalism. And I called the Detroit News and I said, I need to come down and show you my work. And they said, well, you know, we're really, I said, well, I, I, I'm not looking for a job. I just want to show you my photographs. And so I got in with the photo editor, sat down, showed her my work. She picked it up, went into the editor's office, came back out and said, I sent seven photographers to Hudson's. No one came back with what you did. Would you like an internship? I mean, it doesn't happen, right? And, and, but that is how I got into journalism. And my work, you know, the time I was at the Detroit News was my education. They sent me all over the world. They gave me assignments to have breakfast with Andy Warhol, which is really the only time I'm going to get into the celebrity quotient of, you know, what I've been able to photograph or who I've shot. But I was, a, you know, I was a kid when this happened. And Andy Warhol was a big deal, but now he's a really big deal, right? You know, and this was a year before he passed away. And I asked him, I said, how do you see yourself being photographed? He said, with that interesting sculpture in the background. And that was the Renaissance Center. So this is, you know, kind of one of the images I, I keep carting out because it's Andy Warhol. I mean, come on. Um, the news sent me to Israel for a month. It was my first time overseas. Um, that's the work that was nominated for a Pulitzer. We weren't looking for the differences between the Arabs and the Israelis. We were looking for the similarities. So it was, it was a Jewish writer who I was traveling with, and then me being Armenian, you know, I get stuck in the back of the plane with a guy, you know, who's Eddie Awad, who's got a party store in Flint, who invites us to his brother's wedding in Nazareth at the YMCA. I mean, you know, when you hear stuff like that, you're thinking, you know, you've read about Nazareth in the Bible, but, you know, the Nazareth YMCA, and there we are. And, and it was incredible. But it's also where I kind of became a born-again Armenian, because there's an Armenian quarter in the old city in Jerusalem. That's the photograph with all the kids in the red. And it, it was just, this is a side of me that I really want to investigate and, and look deeper into. So, you know, I mean, it is... The Armenian story is, is ancient, and so is this guy, right? Um, you know, but, but so that, that was kind of just a little Israel thing. Um, I was at the news for about three and a half years, and uh, um, when I left, I was offered a position at Detroit Monthly Magazine to be a senior editor there, with the understanding that I could spend more time on any project that I wanted to do. 
And the project that I really wanted to dig into was the Fleetwood Cadillac plant. This was in the neighborhood I grew up in. I would, you know, I could have been there as an employee, which is what most of the kids who grew up in Southwest Detroit ended up doing. And uh, um, I got into the plant, which wasn't easy. I mean, car companies are, do not look kindly on just letting a photographer run around. And it, to be honest with you, it's not safe. You know, I mean, they're, they're dangerous places if you don't know what you're doing. But GM let me in. And uh, um, I stayed there for about a year photographing inside the plant. They were going to be closing it. So, you know, this is, this is where I started to get my reputation of the person who just shows up when things are going to start to disappear, right? Hudson's, the Fleetwood plant, you know, watch out if she shows up at your door. And, uh, um, but I, I, the automobile business was changing. The Fleetwood Cadillac plant was built in, you know, 1927. It was six stories of a car that went up like this. And, and it just wasn't feasible. They were building a new Cadillac plant. The ground floor was so huge that they had to take into account the actual curvature of the earth. I mean, this is Detroit in the automotive industry. That is what we cut our teeth on. I mean, that is who we are as Detroiters. And I knew it was changing. It wasn't so much that this was closing. It's that it was changing, it was evolving. So I spent about a year in the Fleetwood plant photographing it, getting to know the people. I had one guy who was with me all the time, kind of, you know, finding, you know, making sure I was okay. And uh, um, it was an amazing experience. I mean, the auto plants are like cities within themselves anyway. You know, they have, they have a whole, it, it, they're, it, they're, they are their own country. And these plants specifically were, you know, this was before robots. There was, it was physical labor and uh, um, it was amazing. So when Fleetwood closed, I couldn't get in, which made me nuts. You know, I was outside, you know, because the magazine said we're gonna run the story and I said, don't run it yet, I'll get kicked out. And they said, well, you've been spending a year on it, we're gonna run the story. And I'm like, don't run it, I'm gonna get kicked out, I got kicked out. And, and, and the plant closed and I was outside of it um, photographing, you know, the, the people who were milling around. And then I was standing on the street, be ready with your camera and the wind blew this placard in front of me and a Toyota was stopped at the light and I, it, it just was the gift. Sometimes where you really feel you should be maybe isn't the right place for you to be at, right? So that was Fleetwood. But it didn't, you know, it didn't uh, stop me from being obsessed with photographing the automotive industry. <laughs> I mean, I am a Detroit girl. And um, the Rouge plant was, you know, kind of like our Grand Canyon. This is, um, uh, you know, Henry Ford in the early 1900s decided after he had his assembly line figured out that he wanted to build a plant that brought raw materials in on one side and on the other end was a finished car. So it starts with the steel mill and the stamping mill. And, you know, I mean, it was an incredible complex, and it was also going to the Dearborn Assembly Plant, which now at this point was the oldest operating plant in the history of the automobile, was going to be closed, but a new plant was going to be built. Henry Ford insisted on not letting the Rouge, brand, you know, the idea of the Rouge die because it was so significant to Ford. And his, uh, his board said, I don't know, this is going to cost a lot of money. The only car that, the only reason why the new Ford Rouge plant exists is because it was to build the F-150 truck. And that is what that plant is about. And now they're building the electric F-150 truck. So we'll go on with that. But this is from the, the, the deck of the barge at the Rouge. This is inside the steel plant. 
Um, and the steel plant is no longer, it's still operating, but this was old school operation. This was like Blade Runner. I mean, going to another world when you visited this, this was just an incredible experience. Um, not to mention just a little terrifying because it was so hot. Um, but the, you know, the, the raw materials still, you know, would come in. Of course, the glass and everything else was getting shipped in. It wasn't that original way that Henry Ford envisioned it, but it was still in operation and still is to this day, the steel plant is. It's not owned by Ford anymore. Um, but I ended up getting on this barge the last day that the, uh, the Ford Rouge plant was open only because some guy came running in from the ship wanting to see the plant because the last car had rolled down. And I, I said to him, I said, so you're on that ship? And he said, yeah. I said, can you get me on that ship? And he said, yeah, come on. And then all of a sudden I realized I'm somewhere I should not be. Um, I, he took me down into the bottom, which is a terrifying place. And I thought, if something happens to me, no one will know where I am, but it was fine. Um, so anyway, so the steel plant, these are you know, some of the, the hot you know, metal goes into that. They stamped the steel out here. This is, this is an area that is so massive. When I was a kid, we, we used to be able to take a tour of this, if you can believe it or not. Um, but the, the heat, you can feel when these steel plates go rolling past and the negatives from that chute are actually warped. I mean, it, it's just, in, it, it's immense um, and noisy. Right, I mean, the, the plant is just, uh, you know, Robert Frank photographed the Rouge, um, and Diego Rivera went to the Rouge. One of the things in Detroit that we're very proud of is the Rivera murals. So the Rouge has been visited by some of the greatest artists of our time, and, and I feel that when you, you know, having access to that place, you can't help but just envision what it must have been like prior to that. Charles Sheeler spent a lot of time photographing at the Rouge. Um, but this, these are all areas now that you're looking at that are, that no longer exist. You know, they, they, this was an Albert Kahn building as the, as Fleetwood was Albert Kahn, you know, the architect, he, he had photographed, he had, you know, built so many industrial buildings in Detroit. It was incredible. Um, this was, the last day, and this was my guy. And this was my guy at uh, at the Rouge. He went with me everywhere. Tommy B. And uh, it wasn't a sad ending. It was an amazing beginning, because the new Ford Rouge plant was all about the environment. Um, it, you know, they had planted these daylilies not for landscaping, but because they suck the toxins out of the soil. Um, it was, it, it is a quiet, I mean, much quieter than the older plants were, um, assembly line where, you know, the cars rise up and down to the ease of whatever the need is. Um, it was designed by William McDonough, who's a famous architectural um, uh, environmental person. Um, they took components of the old Albert Kahn building which you know is this white roof, and then merged the two and then built a new one. It's got the world's largest living roof in another Guinness World Book of Records thing. I mean, so there's sedum on the roof. It, it, the, the parking lots are porous pavement. I, it, there, everything is recyclable. It was, it's amazing. I mean, it really is. I, I'm not getting paid by Ford. In fact, I never did, you know? I mean, when I, I did this on my own, and, it, you know, again, access, you know? You're in, you're out, you're in, you're out. Um, you know, what is she doing here? And it was finally through meeting one of the vice presidents of Ford, who I got a meeting with, who said to the other person, she's documenting our history, let her do this. And at that point, yeah, I mean, and I didn't see what, was new in black and white anymore. I saw it in color. It was like the Wizard of Oz, you know? I mean, I had photographed all this black and white, the old plant, and then I just felt that it was color. It was a different thing. I, d I, I didn't, you know, when you're, 
When you're a photographer, you can see things in black and white, you can see them in color, but this was all about the color. Um, I also, I was looking at the exhibit that you have up now, and I was telling Raina the Gorski print that you have, you know, which is a huge print. It was one of the first times I had ever seen a photograph printed that big. And it kind of got me obsessed with a large format approach. So I got an eight by 10 view camera, and that's what this photograph is from. This is, this is, although all the engineers said, you know, there really shouldn't be that many sparks. I said, well, it's a time exposure. I don't know. It's a <laughs> <laughs> so the Rouge was great, and um, I, it was, their 100th anniversary, you know, they, they used the work for various things that, you know, were kind of telling their story. And it was important because if I hadn't been persistent enough, it wouldn't exist. And that's, you know, that's why I'm a photographer. But when I, I, I've been really, this was kind of like the crazy assignment of all times. I, I was hired by a company out of Grand Rapids, Amway, and uh, to go around the world and document their children's philanthropic programs, which was unbelievable. I, I mean, and I wanted to be able to own, um, own in the, in the sense of take pictures that were more what I would want to see, not what the client would want to see. So I also carried around a wide lux camera. And so I did black and white, and that was kind of like they weren't interested in that, you know? A, a, you know, but the color was where it was at. But we went from, you know, I went to China five different times. You know, this is like orphans in Inner Mongolia or a boat school, you know, that, that uh, um, you know, that, that it just crazy stuff that I was able to kind of be present in. You know, you'd get in, You'd fly in, you'd get on a bus, you'd drive for hours and hours, you'd get off, you know, you'd, you'd have like a couple hours wherever it was you were at, if that. Sometimes it was even less. But, uh, um, you know, so I'm photographing in color, I'm photographing in black and white. I'm just like Camp China at that time, you know, because this would have been, you know, in the, the 2000s, 19, you know, the, that, that kind of period of time was changing. When I first went, my first trip to Beijing, it was this dusty city where everybody was wearing a Mao uniform and riding a bicycle. And by the time my last trip was, they were Mercedes and BMWs and their third ring on the sun. And I thought, this must have been what the United States had to have felt like during the Industrial Revolution, right? And then you would go into these, uh, these, these schools with these kids a lot of them never had even seen a Caucasian before, and they would come up and say, hello, how are you? And they're learning English. And I mean, it was just unbelievable, really. Um, children, you know, I mean, this was at a time when a lot of my friends were having kids, and, and, and I'm looking at all this, but I realized that, that these were my children, you know? I mean, these, this, this, this was what I wanted to be able to do, was to be able to travel to these places and, and, you know, take these photographs. I just feel so fortunate. So, so I, you know, we went, went to China, um, Tenement Square, uh, you know, the, the boarding schools, which were terrible, to be honest with you. Um, you know, and, and you meet with the government people or the heads of corporations when you go there and, you know, they say, you know, I know you go into a house and you see the dirt floor and you think that's very quaint. We don't want to see that, which makes a lot of sense to what you're, what's happening in China now with, you know, them, you know, wanting to kind of hold back on their poverty or whatever. They don't want that portrayed. They want to be portrayed as, as this modern forward country. Um, this is one of those things that we're in the bus and we're getting ready to leave and I look out the window and I just scream, stop! And I, I mean, look at these kids. <laughs> They're stuffed animals. Um, I went to India um, to a blind school that Helen Keller was at. I mean, 
these words would, you know, these places would, that I knew growing up, these names, I just couldn't even believe some of the stuff that I was standing in the middle of. Um, this is Japan. Um, you know, different, these are all children's programs. These are, you know, what happened with Amway was they, they wanted to give a, a sizable donation to a children's charity, and the charity had said, well, I don't know, Amway, I'm not sure we want to be associated with you. And they thought, well, then what are we doing already on our own for kids? And that's how this project evolved. This is, these were things that were already in place that their different people were doing. And um, I spent about 10 years documenting it for them. It was incredible. Um, this was a school for, this was a camp for blind children in Japan. I mean, all about getting them into nature and being able to feel, you know, the breeze. This was where I realized I had to stay in shape because I was running up a mountain and the blind kids were beating me, right? I mean, it was just, you know, and, and you know, the, the transportation, I, it, it really was an amazing experience. Uh, Thailand, Operation Smile. Um, again, just, you know, grabbing something on the run in Korea, South Korea. The Tarahamara, I, I mean, okay, you know how we are with our kids here in the United States. <laughs> Would you let your daughter run around these mountains? <laughs> you know, I was just like, oh my gosh. They're, uh, this is kind of like the Grand Canyon of Mexico, and this is, they're, they're, the Tarahamara are indigenous to the area, and they're known for running, and it, a lot of these places are like going back in time. Um, it, it, it is, you feel like you're time traveling. I mean, the airplane is an amazing thing, right? You get on, you get off, you're, you're on the other side of the world. Um, so, these little guys. So cute. And, and the kids take care of the kids. I, I, I mean, it was just... Uh, And I always end up finding an Armenian. This was in Russia. <laughs> They're like, oh, he's Armenian. And I thought, I figured, you know. This is in Turkey, in Romania. Um, you know, the, a lot of the, uh, the, you know, the places where the Romanian orphans are up for adoption. South Africa. Schools. I mean, just the curry was so good there. God, food was amazing. Um, Africa, Kenya. I've been to five times. I think my first trip was I did a project for Coca-Cola, but this was. Um, I'm not showing those. I'm showing the, this, this. These were, you know, kind of like my photographs, right? And. These were the kind of photographs that were used for the project. This is where they, women walk, you know, through the villages to get to places so these kids can be, can have their tuberculosis, which is just literally a drop in their mouth. So we traveled all over, you know, to different clinics in, in Kenya with, you know, and to, you know, this woman had just given birth to this baby. You look down and you see the toys that the kids make, you know, that's, it, it's not, and then they always come to say goodbye. So amazing. Kids are the same everywhere, all over the world. There's nothing different about any of them. My buddy Samuel. Samuel hung out with me all day, carried my little tripod for me. I, it's just like amazing. And then this guy, I mean, again, look at his, you know, his car, a coat hanger and, and some tin cans. So now we're going to go back to Armenia, which I've traveled back and forth to for the last 30 years. Um, I 
went for the first time after the earthquake in um, 89, 88, and uh, um, just kept going back. Uh, w Armenia at that time was still under Soviet rule um, and became an independent country like a year later. So it was interesting to see that bridge, that transition happen. But it was also kind of, uh, you know, traveling back in time because, you know, this is how they bake bread. This is like an oven at the feet, and this is three generations in the village of Saznachan. Um, this was a photographer's studio. He's sitting on the bench, and uh, um, it's just surreal. I just liked it. Um, so these are all early Armenia work. Uh, the earthquake was devastating. Over 6,000 people were killed in, in mostly two villages, in, in Gumri and in Spitak. And the only thing that had been built was the cemetery. And the people who had gotten money had spent money on these elaborate tombstones. They were just incredible. And this was kind of where I lost it because, you know, you wonder, oh God, why do these terrible things happen? And why am I here? And, uh, you know, that's, you just have to bite your lip, shoot through it, and, and get the story out there. So in, I'm going to jump a little back and forth between historic Armenia, which is now Turkey, and present-day Armenia, which is now an independent country. But this is, uh, um, this, this was Turkey. I, I worked on, for the 100th commemoration of the genocide um, in 2013, the 100th commemoration was in 2015. In 2013, I had always wanted to retrace my grandmother's steps. And when I was 18 years old, I was a, a, a friend of our families who was a scholar who had spent a lot of time getting oral histories. Oral histories are very important with your family, no matter what your background is. But she had said to me, sit down with a tape recorder and get your grandmother's story. I was 18 years old. So now I'm listening to this tape and retracing her steps where she was at. Um, you know, Armenia was, most of what is Turkey now historically was Armenia. And uh, this was, uh, you know, you're talking about medieval times, kings and queens and castles. This was Cease, you know, Cease Castle. Um, and this was in a, a village. This is a mixture of kids, right? I mean, everybody looks at them, oh, they're so cute, they're Armenian. And it's like, no, actually, they're Kurdish. I'm sure there's some Armenian blood there. But, uh, you know, they're, they're, they're in this village surrounded by these 13th century hotchkars, which are cross stones which are like their coloring books. I mean, they've got crayons, and they're coloring them in. I, it, it's just, and kids, again, they just come, they literally come running to you. Um, so I'm just going to kind of go through these, these churches that, for the most part in historic Armenia, present-day Turkey, are abandoned, and um, the villages that, you know, this was in the village that my grandmother was originally from, um, which is in Stepa, which is in Sepastia, and my great grandfather was a shepherd, right? So here I am in the land of my great grandfather, who was a shepherd, and I'm standing here, and but here comes a little shepherd, like Cecil B. DeMille, right? Cue the sheep. Here we go, and and our driver, who had taken really good care of us throughout this whole trip, just looked at me and said, "That could have been you." I'm like, yeah, good thing they got on the boat. Um, but these are the kind of massive churches that, that have been abandoned when the Armenians had to leave, you know, it's a forced, had to leave during the genocide. Um, the, I, this is crazy, right? So this is kind of one of those, like, modern, uh, one of those, those stories that um, uh, an Assyrian queen fell in love with an Armenian prince and wanted to marry him, but he was already married and he wouldn't leave his wife, so she told his soldiers to kill all 
kill his family and they accidentally killed him. And then the, the, the rumor was that this stone would had these dogs that lived around it and the dogs could lick the person and bring them back to life, which of course it didn't. Um, this is the, uh, the town that Arshal Gorky, the artist, is, was, was from outside of Van. This is uh, Akdamar, which is an island. Um, these stones, the engravings on the church, during the time when they were built, were filled with emeralds and jewels. Armenia never, this is a, a poorly uh, renovated, uh, the, the Turkish government has not done a really good job of our, you know, renovating or, you know, restoring these Armenian things. They, they you know, they would rather avoid the story, but it, th this is another church in Vaughn where, you know, you find the lady who's got the key, and she goes and unlocks the door, and then when she opens, standing here. I, I, I can't even, I mean, I just, I can still hear the cracking of the carpeting as I'm walking on it. This was a church, uh, St. Bartholomew, which they say um, St. Bartholomew's bones are, were buried there. And it had, been it had been fully standing until the 1970s when it was then turned into kind of a Turkish military and they used the church for target practice. And, and, and you go inside and you see the hand carving of all these, you know, it's, they're just... Uh, Incredible. This is the medieval town of Ani. And it, yeah, on the Silk Road, this was a major spot. This, you know, was Armenian, wasn't Armenian, you know, the pogroms, the, the wars, the this, the that. By the early um, 19th century, it was completely abandoned. Um, but it was ca it's called the Land of a Thousand Churches. And uh, uh, there are some incredible, I mean, the, the, the frescoes are still like that. I mean, it's just incredible. It's a haunted place. I mean, you, you cannot go there and not carry it back with you. It's, it's just an eerie place. And this is the border between Armenia and Turkey, the, between Ani and the Broken Bridge, which is from like the seventh century. Um, that's how close Armenia and Turkey I is with the border. And to think that Ani, this, this you know, incredibly significant place, is not accessible to, our, you know, it's, it's kind of like, ugh. Um, but, you know, before Christianity, I mean, they were pagans. So this is a, um, the only, I think, the only surviving pagan temple in Armenia, Garni. Um, the remains of the first church. The, the church that, the, the Etchmiadzin, it's called, it's kind of like our Vatican. Um, the guy with the cross on his, on his hood is, is our Verhapar, which is our Pope, pretty much. And this is the blessing of the children on Palm Sunday, which is organized chaos. Um, it's the roof of the, you know, looking up at Etchmiadzin. I had asked for some, I, I'd asked about the wax and the candles because, you know, they, they go to church, they like candles, the candles are everywhere, it's just lots of that. And they recycle the wax, so they take the wax from these candles and make more candles, which says to me it's like a prayer upon a prayer upon a prayer, it just continues on. I, I don't think it was take your daughter to work day, but... You know, this little puff of pink, so cute, right? Um, this is the oldest university in the world. I'm into my world records tonight. Um, Datev, which has the world's longest tram, which is very modern, that takes you, sweeps you over this gorge, up the mountain, into this incredible, you know, one, another, yet another church. Uh, this is Mount Ararat in the background. And uh, um, the road to Artsakh, which presently is, is a contested area and causing a lot of problems. 
Um, this is the largest cemetery that we have um, left in Armenia, Noravank. It, it was originally, there was a bigger one in Artsakh, which is Azerbaijan flattened. Um, and uh, this is the one we have left. This is Lake Sevan. Armenia is a landlocked country, and this is the only body of water. And it's a pretty big one. The fish are good. And they're still building churches. They have 2,000 churches that were in Turkey, and there are about 2,000 churches in present-day Armenia. I mean, instead of, like, building a big city, they just had all these kings and queens that had their... Their, their own areas and built their churches. And when, and when you go into these churches, you're walking over graves because, you know, everyone who had built the churches are, are, are buried there. It's, it's, it's really uh, fascinating. But the architecture is just amazing. And then you get into some of the frescoes and things like that. So, okay. I'm going to wrap it up. Um, so I'll just kind of, you get the drift. As, as Richard Manugian said to me once, wow, it's a lot of stones. <laughs> but, you, you know, I mean, and then you go into these places and the, and the sparrows are, you know, flying. The starlings are back and forth. Grandmothers lighting candles. You know, old ladies begging for money in the cemetery. But uh, on my last trip there, I, I, these are all iPhone photos. I kind of, I had an exhibition at the Fort Wayne Museum of Art, and I, I wanted to, you know, I was shooting black and white film, but I wanted to kind of bring the iPhone into it and the accessibility of the iPhone. We all carry this in our pocket now, right? You know, you learn how to use this tool. It's a great it's a great thing for you to be able to, you know, everybody's taking pictures with their phone. So these are... These are with my iPhone. You know, they're little prints, and I just kind of got a personal kick out of hanging iPhone photos in a museum. <laughs> you know, hopefully encouraging people to, you know, think about it a little deeper. So now I'm back in Detroit. This is kind of like the old Detroit. <laughs> Th this was an abandoned train line, the DeQuinter Cut, that they have renovated into a modern walkway that is really transforming the city. But again, I guess I'm back to my old tricks. I hear something is gonna change. It's not gonna be like this anymore. This is an area that nature and graffiti artists had reclaimed. And I spent a year photographing it through the seasons because now none of this would exist. And this is uh, part of some work that is actually gonna be in a show that opens um, in a gallery in Michigan on next Friday. So that I just thought I would, you know, kind of wrap it up with a little color, a little fun, and uh, the DeQuinder cut. So. so now I'm playing with these images, right? I'm merging them, I'm taking two photographs which go together. You know, it's kind of like become a game for me. You know, these are two different pictures. You can, you can see when you really start looking at it, you can see the split, right? But it, it's just, um, I don't know. I've never really, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, this time I decided, okay, I'm going to play with the seasons, so. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs>